Okay, so we were doing uh, finite temperature field theory last time. And um, my impression is that we didn't get very far, is that right? Yes. So um, I think it'd be good to, to um, start with that. Is there a question on the, on the homework? Yes. So, so you, uh, so blended, uh, you you put some more information on online, but I'm I was still a bit confused about uh, the indices and the the dimension or the dimensions of the whole thing because you still have the gamma matrices in there. The gamma so, matrices are still yeah. All right. So so I'm going to have it totally explicit. What we have is E psi bar. Uh, let us say alpha s, s for going from 1 to 4. Then it's gamma mu s, s prime, psi, whoops, I use other ones. Let me move a little bit of space. Yeah. Well, let's, let's specify that it says U2 explicitly. So this is alpha beta. So the alpha and the beta are, are uh, labeling different fields? Different Dirac fields? Right. The alpha beta are representing. There's two different species of. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you a chocolate in a minute. No, that's okay. So alpha beta equals one to two, a equals one to three, s s prime equals one to four. Great question. Uh, Okay, let's, any other questions? So let's have uh, our Hamiltonian look like this. Pi squared plus grad phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus some p of phi. All right, so suppose that's the Hamiltonian, and I'm going to define as before V to be 1 half squared phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus p of phi. Okay, so everything except for pi, I'm calling V. So just to simplify the notation, so H is an integral of pi squared over 2 plus v d cubed x. So now it looks just like the uh, case of uh, ordinary quantum mechanics where you have p squared and v of q. And sorry for starting early, but well. This is, this is for the homework. Okay, and we have these eigenstates of the field and uh, the field at time zero. Notice here that these guys don't have a um, don't have a time index in them. On the other hand, oh, oh, you have to drop my people off. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're gonna all be. On the other hand, there could be many of them because as we, we insert these uh, complete sets of states many times to build up the path integral, and these uh, uh, we then give a, a time to distinguish one from another, and um, the analog of the 
inner product of Q prime with P prime is some uh, bugger factor E to the I integral phi prime of x, phi prime of x, P cubed to x. And I've, I've stopped writing arrows over the three vectors because it's just I don't know. I find both the arrows and the whole face type is kind of silly. I don't know what the hell to do with vectors, <laughs> frankly. If anybody has a good idea, I agree. There's nothing good to do. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we're going to have d pi prime as product, uh, d pi prime, and so forth. Product over x. Okay, so as before, what we find is that uh, phi double prime e to the minus epsilon h phi prime is um, an integral of um, phi double prime e to the minus epsilon over 2 integral pi squared d cubed x, phi prime, this is the limit epsilon goes to zero, e to the minus epsilon integral v of phi d cubed x, uh, phi prime, d pi prime. And the reason we're allowed to split the exponential up is because epsilon is small? Yes. Yes, otherwise that's... Um, not allowed, and um, I'm, I have minus infinity to plus infinity in the notes. The idea is that we're just integrating over all of these pi's, um, and so we pull out this part since this is an eigenstate of this operator, and. Um, we then have an inner product from phi prime, phi prime, and phi prime, phi prime. And so this is some, uh, well, it's this quarter factor. Actually, it's not that one. It should be that one absolute a squared. Um, e to the minus epsilon integral of v of phi prime d cubed x integral e to the integral minus epsilon phi prime squared over 2 uh, plus i phi prime phi double prime minus phi prime oops phi prime d cubed x d pi prime and um, as before we're going to use the abbreviation phi prime dot to be phi double prime, well, let me put in an x here, uh, phi double prime of x minus phi prime of x over epsilon. And then we uh, do the pi integrations, and what we get is uh, phi double prime e to the minus epsilon h phi prime is some, well, I can just call it s prime, e to the minus epsilon integral phi dot prime squared over 2 plus v of phi prime d cubed x. Oh. All right, no, let me just mention that um, this is a function functional of phi double prime and phi prime, the phi double prime enters because of the abbreviation for phi dot prime, phi dot prime involving both phi prime and phi double prime. And so the next thing to do is since we see that that works, we just string together a zillion of them and that gives us then that phi sub beta e to the minus beta h phi zero is some overall uh, crazy factor e to the minus an integral zero to beta 
dt integral of a half sine dot squared plus v of phi uh, d cubed x and then d phi. So it's a path integral of all, over all fields that go from the field phi zero to uh, at time zero to phi sub beta at time beta and it's an integral of basically the energy density over that volume in four dimensional space. And this thing is called the Euclidean path integral and if we expand the definition of V then it's phi beta e to the minus beta h phi zero is so we call it after e plus e to the minus uh, integral zero to beta dt integral d to beta say um, a half uh, pi squared plus rad phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus some uh, p of phi and then uh, d phi. So that's that's the expression. Beta, of course, is if we're doing finite temperature field theory, one over kt and um, If we just re just say that this Hamiltonian is an integral of a Hamiltonian density d cubed x, then you can rewrite this as n e to the minus integral of Hamiltonian density, and it's uh, we, we can call it d fourth x if we want, but it's zero to beta in um, time uh, variable. Now, the partition function z of beta is defined as the trace of uh, e to the minus beta h where you sum over all the states of the system. And uh, so the phi's form a complete set of states, so it's phi e to the minus beta h phi uh, d phi. Now this this d phi is sort of is d phi at one time. It's just oh the function the eigenvalue phi of x spatial x. But we have an expression for this, and that's just setting beta equal to zero. So it's the diagonal element of this, and that means over here instead of integrating from fields. Uh, phi zero to phi beta. Um, we're now going to be integrating over all fields from phi to phi, and so uh, this is. Uh, I'll just write it as n e to the minus zero to beta d fourth x h of phi. Uh, Phi, but we keep in mind that whoops that the integral now is over all phi. It's, it's now over all fields phi. So here there's no restriction on the phi's at all. It's um, uh, well I shouldn't say that. It's over all it's over all loops. That is to say fields the, the final time field is the same as the initial time field. So it's a loop in fields in, in function space. Um, the density operator rho, whoops. The density operator rho is e to the minus beta h over z of beta so that it has unit trace, trace of rho is 1. Um, and as before, we have our, our Euclidean fields um, are e to the minus th phi uh, at time 0 e to the th 
And um, so this is a four vector, this is a three vector. How does that work? <laughs> well. <laughs> It's the same definition we used when we were talking about finite temperature quantum mechanics. The path in the finite temperature quantum mechanics. Or, you, or quantum mechanics in, I don't remember at this point whether I called it real or imaginary time because it's sort of a flip. Anyway, I guess that's why they use the term Minkowski and Euclidean. That way you get away from real and Imaginary. This is Euclidean. But how is that a four vector? I mean, it has a T in there. But. Yeah, it, because it's got a T in there, it's a four vector. So does this mean space time is a four dimensional Euclidean manifold versus a Minkowski? Yeah. yeah, you can say that. Okay. What does that mean? It's just your metric is just one more. The point is, the point is, look up here. <clears throat> the point is, oh, 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 hey, hey, hold the phone here. There's, um, there's a mistake on the board. You see here we had a phi dot? That means this thing is actually phi dot squared. So that's the sense in which it's Euclidean. I actually skipped an equation. In other words, this h of phi is a half du phi squared summed over all four mu's plus m squared over 2 phi squared plus t of phi. So that's what this Hamiltonian density is. And so it looks like the, it's like the action, it's like the action for the scalar field, but Instead, it has Euclidean metric, or equivalently, it's like the energy density for the scale field. The notes are online. This is chapter 17 of the uh, book I'm writing. Okay, so remember last time what we showed was that uh, if you had a time ordered product of Q's, you could write that as um, I, I, I don't quite remember how we wrote it before, but anyway, uh, let, all right, let me just let me just say what we're going to do here. What we're going to do now is we're going to say let's consider the mean value of the time ordered product of say phi Euclidean at x1, prime Euclidean at x2. So this is a Euclidean time order product. And this is then the trace, well by definition it's the trace of rho times the time order product of um, prime Euclidean at x1, prime Euclidean at x2. And this, then, is um, the trace of e to the minus beta h, Euclidean time order product, once again, by e. This, these notes are kind of repetitive. <clears throat> Divided by the trace of e to the minus beta h, which is z. And now um, we can use this definition of what this Euclidean time is and 
Maybe I should have an extra equation in here, so let me try to do that equation on the fly. It's, um, this is going to, well, all right, let me give you the final answer rather than trying to do it on the fly. It's a little bit confusing, there's some minus signs. What you wind up with is phi of x1, phi of x2, e to the minus integral zero to beta, the energy density or the Euclidean action if you want, e fourth x, d phi, divided by integral e to the minus zero to beta, a to phi, e fourth x. Okay, so, if you want the Euclidean time order, the mean value of the Euclidean time order product in the system described by the density operator rho, which is e to the minus beta h over the trace of that, then that's equal to the product of the fields, path integral over all of them, weighted by the energy density, divided by a normalization factor. I'm a little confused about the distinction you're making over here between having the pi there and having phi dot. Yes. <coughs> um, I mean, if I just look at, if I compare this Hamiltonian to the one we have written over here, and just get rid of all the common terms, that the, the okay, uh, this is the this is the real Ham this is the Hamiltonian period. I I'm talking about this one right here, right? So if I compare this to this expression we have over here. For that, Right. Right, 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 right. So my question is, right, is right, it right there? Uh -huh. Is it the canonically conjugate? This is the real Hamiltonian. <clears throat> and this is sort of the Euclidean this is if you want you can call this the Euclidean action density. But equivalent I mean, in other words, pi is phi dot, just right. as that's in that's my question. pi is q. Pi q dot. Right. The, to the extent that pi is q dot then uh, here pi is phi dot, but, but we're, we're distinguishing between phi and pi. We inter the canonical variables, we integrated over the pi's and got the phi's. Okay. Hmm. You're probably entitled to another piece, but you probably don't need to do All right, well, you know, once you can uh, do something for n equals 2, the jump to n equals n is no problem. And, um, ah, but there are two things next to do. Suppose, all right, so there are two steps. So in a sense, I've, I've kind of um, short-circuited this. So let's, let's first of all say that the time order product of phi, phi Right, phi Euclidean x1 dot 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 phi Euclidean x10, that mean value, which of course is the trace of rho, times this time order product of phi Euclidean x1, phi Euclidean xn. This is then an interval of phi of x1 dot 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 phi of xn e to the minus integral h of phi e fourth x again zero to beta d phi over the integral e to the minus integral. Okay. So that's that's what it is in finite temperature field theory and this is what you use in condensed matter physics or in, I'm told this is used a lot in nuclear physics. I haven't actually seen any of it, but um, I, I know this is the sort of thing that one, one uses in um, condensed matter. If you now take the limit, the temperature going to zero or beta going to infinity, then rho, which is, um, e to the minus beta h over its trace goes to the projection operator. The projection operator on the vacuum. Okay. 
And so consequently, the mean value in the vacuum of the time ordered product of phi Euclidean x1 dot 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 phi Euclidean x10 is then an integral phi of x1 dot 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 phi of xn e to the minus, and now it really is an integral of either the Euclidean action or the energy density d fourth x all of Euclidean space, and then divided by the integral of h of phi d fourth x d phi. And the only restriction on the functional integration is that you're integrating over loops in the field space. So you integrate over a field that goes from some arbitrary field at time minus infinity to some arbitrary field at time plus infinity. Okay. And this is, uh, this is basically the formula that's used in lattice gauge theory. What one does then is approximate this ratio of path integrals, and one uses Monte Carlo techniques, and um, so what, are, what would these products be like some type of correlation uh, lattice, this product of fields? Well, to tell you the truth, the one that was first used was one that was suggested by Wilson. And it was... Wilson lives? Yes. Do you want another candy? No. <laughs> All right, what is this Wilson loop? This is a time and path ordered product of e to the minus i or plus i e, whatever the gauge constant is, integral a mu of x. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, let's do it this way. Okay, so you're summing over them, but this thing is a gauge theory. And so this is A, A, T, A. These are the generators of the gauge group. So in SU2, these be sigma, sigma A over 2. And that's, that's the thing that you'd be using. Instead of that, that's, in other words, the particular time ordered product of Euclidean fields is this, Euclid, this time, or, and this is a Euclidean here. This has Euclidean time dependence. It's Euclidean time dependence, and it's time ordered and path ordered, and it's a loop. Wilson, loop. It's a loop here in space time, so it goes from a particular point back in. Now, <coughs> is that interesting at all on a Euclidean manifold? It's kind of boring. Uh, is this boring, or don't they usually capture topological properties of the space time? Doesn't well, it can. That's another direction. This what Wilson was after was the confinement signal, and the confinement signal is the following: it's that this integral is supposed to go as, or let us say that it's that the the mean value in the QCD vacuum of this thing, because if it's QCD, then these are lambdas that go on. Um, this is supposed to go as e to the minus the area of the loop, the area of the space-time loop. And all right, but there are certain problems with this this approach. I, I can I let me just succinctly tell you two of them. One is that this is strictly zero. And the reason is, at least if you, do, if you compute what this is in the case of um, uh, QED, pure free QED, no fermions, so it's a quadratic theory. In that case, you can compute this explicitly, and it's zero. And the, re the reason it's zero is that you've got this gauge field integrated on a loop, and 
that loop means that you, you, you're, you're really integrating over d fourth x or d cubed x, and in order to shrink it down to a loop, the, the gauge field has to be multiplied by a, a double function of um, degree two, at least, maybe three, but at least two. And that, okay? So you're talking effectively about an infinitely strong electric field on this loop. And that, mean, that means that that uh, turns out. So that's one problem. Another problem is that the, the Wilson's approach is to replace all the fields in the theory by, um, well, this thing here. You can put space time on a lattice, which is fine. But what he then says is that this thing e to the minus i e a t a d q d, d, d x along this link is in fact simply uh, an element of um, S U three or in, in the case of Q C D and so he replaces this thing simply by an element of S U three and then integrates over S U three whereas what we're supposed to be doing is integrating over all the fields and there's a difference and in and in particular, the difference doesn't so up, show up so much in this because this thing is an element of SU3, but rather in the action. And what he takes as the action, instead of being integral, F A mu nu, F A mu nu minus a quarter, say, e fourth x, instead of that, uh, he replaces this by a trace and uh, of, um, gosh, I don't even remember the exact formula because I never liked it. But, um, is this a Stern Simon's term? No, it's, 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 it's essentially the trace of the product of the group elements. Uh, it's, it's basically the trace of e to the minus e integral a uh, dx. In other words, it's this thing thought of as an element of SU3. It's the product of the gauge of, of the group elements G1, G2, G3 adjoint, G4 adjoint. So it's a product of group elements. That means, and it's a trace of that, that means it's bounded because the group is compact. Whereas this thing can go to infinity. And so there's a, the, and, and, so this is called the compactification of the gauge group. And one problem that it has is that if you do this for the case of quantum electrodynamics, again, suppress the fermion, so it's a solid theory, you get a confinement signal in Wilson's formulation and strong confidence, which is clearly crazy. So then the question arises, is the confinement signal by this gauge theory or is it like as much an artifact as it is in uh, lattice QE, QE? All right, anyway, I shouldn't have gone on so long on that, on that tangent, but um, maybe it's all right to do that. Okay. Any other questions? So this group that you're talking about is the group generated by the, the bosons, the scales are? Well, in a gauge theory, in a gauge, in a non-abelian gauge theory, you have um, a gauge group, and uh, for example, in your homework problem, the gauge group is SU two. I only showed you for simplicity the uh, part of the action that has to do that you need to calculate the scattering of the fermions. Uh, there's an, but it's not actually, the rest of it isn't actually that complicated. The rest of it is F mu nu squared, where the F mu nu is a little more complicated than the uh, ordinary abelian S, F mu nu. And in fact, if you define a covariant derivative as D mu plus I E A mu, where by A mu you mean A mu T A summed over A, then you can define F mu nu 
as the commutator of dmu with dmu. Does this work for any group you might want to Any group, yeah. That's one of the attractive features of gauge theory is that it's geometrical and um, uh, there are things to get used to, which I'll probably assign as a homework. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but it's 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 very nice and uh, all right now now I, I think we've done enough for the moment at least of, uh, for the uh, uh, in Euclidean space for the moment let's now go to um, back to Minkowski space. And in this case, instead of what we started with, we've got tons of prime. Um, we have phi double prime e to the minus i epsilon h phi prime. And so this is then just an integral phi double prime e to the minus i epsilon over 2 i squared d cubed x phi prime phi prime e to the minus i epsilon integral v of phi d cubed x phi prime and then d pi prime. Okay. So this is, we've inserted the dyadic and we've used the usual approximation. The v is the same v. Then this is some, actually it's activated as squared. Um, e to the minus i epsilon equal v of phi prime actually e cubed as and then an integral e to the integral minus i epsilon i prime squared over 2 plus i i prime i double prime minus i prime e x e pi prime and then all together that's just some s prime e to the i epsilon integral phi dot squared over 2 minus v of phi, uh, well, prime d cubed x. All right. So this matrix element is that, and uh, we use the same abbreviation for phi dot prime, namely phi dot prime is phi double prime minus phi prime. And um, and you can then expand this, and you see this is just s prime e to the i epsilon, and it's just uh, the 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 action density, namely a half d mu phi d mu phi uh, minus p. So this is for one time, one time slice. You string together a zillion of them, and you just get this action built up. And so your your the, the, the final formula is if you write s of phi as then an integral of a half d mu phi d mu phi or what left out minus m squared over two phi squared. action as this d4 x, then the path integral is um, uh, what do I want to say here? Um, phi uh, at um, phi say t e to the minus i Oh, actually I was, well, all 
All right, I'm doing here 2 minus 2i th, and this is phi, so minus t is then an integral e to the i s of phi d phi, so, uh, apart from some normalization factor. So, and here if you let t go to t become very, very large, then you have an integral over, you have a difference in time that's that's arbitrarily big, and then this s of this this d fourth x is overall in Minkowski space. Okay. So now we just go back. We recall the definition of the Heisenberg field operator. It's e to t i t h phi of x to zero e to minus i t h. And um, then you have e to the minus i t h phi of x t1 phi of x t2 e to the minus i t h is e to the minus i t minus t1 h phi of x t0 e to the minus i one minus two h phi of x zero e to the minus i t e minus two h and um, imagine we have the t one is later than t two so this is this is then e to the minus i t h um, Euclidean time ordered product. Uh, phi Euclidean, no, not Euclidean, it's the ordinary one. X1, X2, E to the minus I, TH. So in other words, the time ordered product of two Minkowski field operators sandwiched between these huge time evolution factors. Well, actually, they're unit totals. But anyway, the time is huge. Um, is the same as this, and we can then take its matrix elements and we get phi double prime e to the minus i th time ordered product phi of x1 phi of x2 e to the minus i th phi prime is then. Um, normalization factor phi of x1, phi of x2, uh, e to the i, s of phi, d phi. And now, in the limit t goes to infinity, you just integrate over all fields. Uh, I should say all fields, but it's all fields that really go from phi prime to phi double prime. So, um, I should mention that. It's, what would be nice would be to have a notation for functional integrals in which you could put in the limits the way you have, you know, integral from A to B. Why you put in the limits on the integration side? Phi prime right. to phi double prime. I think that's a good idea. I mean, is that, could that mean something different? No, I, I think it's fine. <laughs> I mean, yes, it could, of course, but <laughs> I think it's fine. All right, now, now what we want to do is um, start fiddling with this. In particular, we want to multiply this from one. All right, let me, let me go to something simpler. What we have, our previous formula was phi double prime, e to the minus i t h phi prime was n integral phi prime to phi double prime e to the i s I hope I always have a plus sign anyway s of phi d phi okay that's that now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by vacuum 
by double prime. Well, this is the grand state of the theory, and I should write this a little more carefully. That's the grand state. Okay, so this is then n integral, and now we're going to integrate over phi prime and phi double prime. So now these things go away, and we have e to the i s of phi uh, zero phi double prime uh, phi prime zero. So we've multiplied both sides by that, but we're integrating over everything d phi. Okay. Now, what is this? Well, this is just the identity operator, and the integral over here, so we're actually integrating, I should say, d phi prime, d phi double prime. That, this gives you the identity, this gives you the identity, and what we have then is vacuum e to the minus 2i th vacuum, I'm saying vacuum for ground state, which is what's in all these things. And so this is e to the minus 2it e0, because the vacuum's an eigenstate of h with eigenvalue e0, and it's a normalized state, you just get this. So now we have this equation. But we could have done the same thing with the top equation. We could have multiplied by vacuum phi double prime, phi prime vacuum, over here also integrated and um, this right hand side is also <coughs> integrated over all phi prime and phi double prime as well. So this over here. Yeah. This over here is integrated over all fields, period, not even all loops, just all fields. And what we get when we integrate over the five primes here is we again get an identity operator. We again get h on this. So we get an e to the minus i t e zero. We get another one over here. And that expression then is e to the minus two i t e zero times vacuum time ordered product. And let me just call it phi one phi n vacuum is then same normalization integral these factors zero phi double prime phi prime zero e to the i s d phi and then phi one dot 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 phi n all that in the integral. All right. Now you take the ratio of the two and two things go away. One is the E0, and the other is the normalization factor that, of course, you always want to get rid of because it's uh, unknown, undefined, awkward, whatever. And then what you have is that the time ordered product then of phi of x1, and these are Minkowski fields is then a ratio of path integrals. But it's still got this pesky zero phi double prime, phi of x1, phi of xn, e to the i s of phi, phi prime zero, e phi, and it's got that divided by the same thing, except no fields. Okay. And we're integrating over absolutely all, all phi there. But we've got the matrix elements at the top and the bottom of phi with the vacuum. Goodness, that clock is slow. That's what happens when we start off time. All right. So what we're going to do now is make a transition to perturbation theory. And um, because it's so early, 
we may we may um, we may get as far as the propagator uh, defined in terms of patterns. So um, the people. The P equals zero case gives us uh, H goes to H zero. So the Hamiltonian H zero is just an integral a half pi squared plus rad five squared plus m squared pi squared. And there's a corresponding S zero, S zero integral I have du phi du phi uh, minus m squared phi squared so that's the action function is zero phi okay now the fields are defined as phi of t and x is e to the i t h zero phi of zero and x to the minus i t h zero. So the fields have the three field time dependence. And now we can just use this formula. In fact, let me just let me just use it in the simple. Let me just use it by just putting a zero here rather than writing it again. This S0 means we have this simpler action. Now with this simpler action, we actually know what this matrix element is. Um, but instead of going there directly, let me um, let me follow the notes. So I'm going to define phi tilde of p as an integral e to the minus i p x phi of x d fourth x. And the notes are written, unfortunately, with the Weinberg metric. But you guys are experienced enough now to cope with that, right? I don't think anything depends on And phi of x is integral. Well, actually, even this was Weinberg metric with pest control you got a minus sign. Phi of x then is e to the i p x phi tilde of p t fourth p over t prime of four. Now, what is, what is quite cute is that if we use this expression for phi, well then, these derivatives just bring down a p. In other words, d lower mu of phi, which is d phi dx upper mu, and, and this is x upper mu, x lower mu. So this is just an integral i p lower mu e to the i p x phi tilde of p equals p over two pi to the four. And uh, similarly, this brings down well, this brings down a uh, p mu with an upper index. And here, do you want me to do this explicitly, or can I just, just no? Okay. <laughs> what happens is you get a very nice acute form for the action. In fact, this diagonal form of the action. In fact, what you can say is that um, when you write phi 
in Fourier space, you're writing it, you're expressing it as a kind of eigenfunction of the differential operator and the action operator. And the result is that S0 of 5 is then minus, minus a half integral by tilde of p absolute value squared p squared plus m squared e fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. And um, I warn you, this is p vector squared minus p zero squared. So uh, we've got the Weinberg metric going here. Well, which the note says explicitly. Also, notice that since the field phi is real, phi star of x is phi of x, it follows that its Fourier transform has this reflection property. Phi tilde of minus p is phi tilde of p complex conjugate. And that's why we get this phi squared here, absolutely. OK. Now, here's the bottom line. Let me give you the bottom line. Uh, you might wonder, why, why do we have these damn terms here that are kind of ugly and awkward and confusing up there and down there? The reason is that they actually give the i epsilons of the Feynman propagator. Mr. Which terms did you say the value of something? Ha! You've heard. You're probably daydreaming. <laughs> and then when I say that, all of a sudden, this one, this one, this one, and that one. So on my, you might go to my office and read one of the things on the door. It's a uh, page Xerox from a marvelous recent book called The Big Short. I forget the name of the author. Anyway, he describes a particular uh, uh, perceptive financial speculator and the way he pays attention to conversations. It's, you should read it in your view news. Okay. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, this is our, so that's the action. Okay, now, what is this thing that we need to know? Five prime vacuum. Well, it's some normalization factor, e to the minus a half integral of five prime tilde for Fourier transform of p squared square root of p vector squared plus m squared d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. That's all in the exponential. But that's all it is. Okay. This is actually an exact result because this is, a, this, this is the vacuum for the free field theory, which is the soluble field theory. Um, So let's see, the, the question is, why is that the answer? And um, I don't have that derivation in my notes here, but let me see, do I refer to it somewhere? Um, right, this is derived in chapter 16, but I didn't bring those notes with me. So if so let me just say this is equation 16.46. I tell you what, next time I'll derive this expression. I think it's something you guys ought to see. Um, all right. For now let's just assume it's true. And by the way, this phi tilde prime is let me just say what this is. This is of three vector p because it's integrated only over three vector p, and it in fact is minus i p dot x three vector five prime of x 
EQ day. So that's actually what the technical definition of that is. Okay, so now we can define a new term called delta S0 of phi. This is the change in phi and the action due to these pesky extra factors here, phi prime zero and zero phi by double prime. And this thing then, well, what is it? It's just clear that it's going to be, uh, it's going to involve this structure. And in fact, it's just pi over two integral square root of p vector squared plus m squared. Uh, times phi tilde prime of p, and I'm putting in t here, squared, plus phi tilde prime of p and minus t, dq p over 2 pi q. Okay, so in other words, if you add this term to the action, and replace the action, you, you change from S0 to S0 plus delta S0, then you can erase the butter factors just as long as you have the modified action here. And I'm calling that modified action then um, I'm going to say that S0 of phi comma epsilon is S0 of phi plus delta S0 of phi. And of course this delta S0, oh, actually that's kind of an, all right, this delta S0 I'm putting in, well, this delta S0 is going to have an epsilon in it, and so, uh, what am I saying here? Yeah, actually my notes are slightly inconsistent, so I need to rewrite this section slightly. Um, so there's an identity we have to use. This is one of those magical Weinberg things. Um, f of infinity minus f of minus infinity is the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of epsilon times the integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e to the minus epsilon of f of t dt. Okay, so that's a uh, a formula which one can derive. In fact, I think what I should do um, Monday is derive this for you as well as that. Um, for the moment, let's just assume that they're true, and that means that this delta S0 you see, this can be thought of as Actually, there isn't a mistake in the notes now that I think about it. We can rewrite this without the epsilon. Using this, we can say it's the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of i epsilon over two integral square root of p squared plus m squared. Integral minus infinity plus infinity by tilde of p and t where e to the minus epsilon f sub a of t dt dq p over 2 pi q. Okay, so in other words, this thing here has a term, we're thinking of t as being plus infinity here, minus infinity there. It's two terms, just like these two terms. Um, oh, and this is a plus. Sorry about that. 
So this thing written this way and then with the identity here looks like this. So that means that we can we that this delta s zero term which is uh, of this form, if we now expand this to first order and epsilon, we're going to ignore this. And then what we have is the delta S zero of phi, the change in the action, is the limit epsilon goes to zero plus of i epsilon over 2 integral square root of p squared plus m squared vector integral minus infinity to plus infinity phi tilde of p and t squared dt dq p over 2 pi cubed. And this is effectively the limit epsilon goes to 0 plus Oh, I epsilon over two. He's going to steal the candy. <laughs> you have to be very careful. About that. Square root of p vector squared plus m squared by tilde of p. Now this is four vector p. D fourth p over two pi to the four. Okay. So that's that's what our change in the action is. And. Now, putting it all together, I just wish I were about a foot tall and I could use all that black space up there. Um, let me write it down here. I'm going to call this S0 of phi comma epsilon then. It's going to be S0 of phi plus delta S0 of phi. And then this is minus a half integral tilde of p squared p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon square root of p vector squared plus m squared d4 p over 2 pi to the 4. Okay, so this is what we're going to call s0 phi and epsilon. Now, Epsilon is just super small, and so epsilon, so we can ignore this thing, we can replace it by one. And then this thing is minus a half integral by tilde of p squared, p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon d fourth p over two pi to the fourth. All right, so that's, that's what S0 phi epsilon. And now, if we use this S0 phi and epsilon, we can come over here and we can use this expression, the mean value in the vacuum or time order product of the fields, as this expression here. And, um, and, we can erase these terms, we can replace these terms by unity. So, in other words, maybe I should go over here. Well, how, how do you replace the, the term of the story? Oh, sorry. How do I want? How did you replace the, the term in the square root into one? Oh, um, it's just that epsilon times the square root in the limit epsilon goes to zero is a very small positive number. The important thing is the sign oh, of epsilon. Okay, all right. So you just call it epsilon prime. All right, so in other words, Vacuum of the free field theory, time ordered product phi of x1, phi of xn, and these have the free field time dependent. So, in a sense, 
the fact that we're getting an exact result here is not all that impressive. But anyway, it's phi of x1 dot 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 phi of x in e to the i s0 of phi and epsilon t phi. There's something wrong with that chart. Over the integral e to the i s0 of phi and epsilon d phi. So that's. Okay. You notice how much better this chalk is than the one I. Okay, so that's our expression. Now the next thing is to define z0 of j as time ordered product e to the i integral j of x, j of x phi of x d4 of x. And so this is an infinite series of products of field operators, all of them in Kowski time order. But we know how to compute these things. And because the formula is so simple, well, simple. That's a, that's a theory. First order. Anyway, what it is is an integral e to the i integral j phi d fourth x e to the i s zero of phi and epsilon t phi over the integral e to the i s zero of phi and epsilon d phi. And remember, now we're integrating over absolutely all fields. There's no uh, restriction at all. All right, so this structure here leads us to go one step further and to say, well, and to define something called S0 of phi epsilon and j as S0 of phi and epsilon plus an integral j of x, phi of x, d4 of x. And um, so in that case, we can write this as e to the i, S0, phi, epsilon, j, d5 divided by the integral e to the i s0 phi epsilon d phi. Now, the next thing to do is to is to use this Fourier transform business. In other words, to write this action in terms of, of the Fourier transform of the field. And you won't be surprised if I say that this is just minus a half integral by tilde of p absolute value squared times p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And again, those are, this is all in the, in the Weinberg metric. And this is minus j tilde star of p, phi tilde of p, minus phi tilde star of p, j tilde of p. All of that e fourth p over two pi to two pi to the four. 
Okay, so that's this S0 phi epsilon and J. And now, the, and that's what we've got up here. So it turns out that if we change variables to sine tilde of P equal to phi tilde of P minus J tilde of P over P squared plus M squared minus I epsilon, then this S0 of phi, epsilon, and j separates into S0 of psi and epsilon plus a term just involving j. And um, that is plus a half. So I'm skipping one step here. J star tilde of p. Well, this is just j of p squared. So let me skip another step. J tilde, since it's so late, j tilde of p squared. In fact, this is that divided by p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon d fourth p over 2 pi to the 4. All right, so that's what that is. And well, we're sort of over time. Um, in any, we're, we're within we're within a few minutes of deriving the propagator form. So what I'll do next time is I'll review the last part of this lecture, derive the Feynman propagator, and then show you how you can formulate perturbation theory in terms of uh, path integrals. And we'll see that the propagator for, uh, for a scalar field falls out of this. And then uh, then one of the natural things to do is to do path integrals for the electrons for a gauge field, like the electromagnetic field, and then show you that the propagator really is that very nice propagator that we've been using for the gauge field. By the way, in this case, I, I didn't tell you what the propagator was. Did I or did not? What the propagator was in the gauge field. Okay. In, in, it's just minus I G mu. In other words, and I, I don't quite remember the signs, but I think it's minus i g mu nu over p squared uh, minus. All right, I don't remember any of the signs. No. Let's say that it's p squared minus i epsilon minus i g mu nu, the nice propagator. We've got these two metrics. You just change that to, you add in there delta AB. So that's the only difference. So in other words, this is the propagator that gives you a uh, vacuum time order product A mu A, A B nu. So that that's it's, that's one that so it's very simple. Yeah, it's either going to be easy or really easy. All right. So the homework is due Monday, but all you have to do is compute I M. So it's kind of trivial. Well, trivial no, but it's kind of it's, uh, it's not hours and hours of traces. Oh, yeah.